my um, mom's house. <laughs> <laughs> it, will it will be, be both. Be right much. <laughs> Going into it. So, okay. All right. So I wanted to first and foremost say, you know, it was Ooh. awesome getting a chance to uh, watch the show and I'm like, or watch the movie. And I'm very, very thankful that you guys were able to join me today on Submissions and Slashers podcast. And I'm speaking with Eric Bloomquist. I got Adam Wepler. I got Carson Bloomquist. And I got Caroline Williams. I mean, like, is the movie here or not? I feel like we're just, there's a young lady of a different ethnicity that is not involved in this thing that would just almost complete the whole entire project, right? I mean, this yeah. is the movie right here. Okay, so yes. first and foremost, I want to know from Eric, I'm going to start with you, like right off the bat, man, like I'm, I'm a real person and I really want to know how you guys are doing. Like we got a pandemic going on. There's still people getting killed. There's riots and protests still going on. And as we're all creative souls trying to exist and, and, and do our things and develop our projects and stuff. The first question I want to ask each one of you guys, I'll start with Eric, then we'll go to Caroline. Uh, Carson and Adam, you can answer last. It's just, how are you guys doing, man? Like for real, as like a real question in this pandemic, dealing with this COVID stuff, trying to get this movie out to people. Like, how are you guys doing, Eric? Starting with you, man. Uh, you know, it's been a trip for me, like it has been for everybody. I think being a creative person, this especially early <laughs> on, like that sort of mini existential crisis that everybody had of like, what what can we do when? creativity isn't really a thing that you can engage in in the same way or even really pursue in the same way. Um, and so that was a hurdle that we all jumped through, but I think we're all lucky to have this, this movie and to be able to, to start putting something out in some way in spite of that and just to have something to, to rally around. I think we're really lucky that we had something in the can towards the end of post at this point. Um, I, I know other people, I mean, I think for all of us, we had a lot of friends who lost jobs. We had a lot of friends who um lost big jobs and and they don't know what the future is they're pivoting out of cities career moves all this stuff and it sucks so um you know but what we always try to do in any kind of climate is to give uh some kind of product that gives people an excuse to get together and engage in dialogue and talk about stuff and have a good time because right. that is something that we as creative people can do and and, and want to do. And that's sort of our modus operandi is to give people an excuse to, to get together and chill and talk and just mm -hmm. be human together. Um, and and health wise, sure. you're, you're good. Family I'm good. Okay. Nobody yeah, nope. I'm not get any scares or anything. I got a couple scares. Did you get any scares? Well, I, got, I got tested the other day. It felt yeah. weird, but I'm okay. All up in the nose and <laughs> just in there reaching for gold. Well, that's good, man. That's good. I'm glad to hear you're you're doing well and, and everybody's fine. Uh, and yeah, man, and, and we appreciate you guys being able to give us something to turn our attention away from during this stuff. What about you, Caroline? Tell me, lady, what's what's going on with you? How you doing? Well, I'm doing fine. Nobody, and I'm knocking wood, nobody's gotten sick. Okay. Um, there is, in California especially, because we're still locked down here, yep. Uh, yep. economically speaking. And it really puts a lot of projects in peril. But one of the things I'm the most excited about, and I grew up in Mississippi in the 60s. Okay. So, so you are aware of this climate that is going on right now. Sweetie, throttle. if you think it can't get worse, it can get worse. Right. And the, yes. I, was, I was born in 1957, Little Rock, Arkansas Central High School. My family moved November 63 to Jackson, Mississippi and JFK was assassinated. Mm -hmm. We made it out November of 69. Um, that was a war, that was yeah. a war. And we press on, as yeah. human beings, we press on. But how hard um, is it, how hard is it to be a young lady in 1969 in America feeling like you had to escape? You know, like because and, not too not too further down the line, we got to see movies like Escape from L.A., Escape from New York, where you're like, okay, Lovecraft well, Country, yeah, Lovecraft Country, <laughs> yeah. It will take you back. Yeah, I've yeah, been yeah. devoted to that show. Yeah, yeah. It resonates for me, it, in a way that a lot of other things don't. And I think it takes more black filmmakers. It takes Tyler Perry, Shonda right. Rhimes, right. Casey Lemons. It takes filmmakers like that to flesh out our history and and bring horror to it but show did, that to us how did that that growing up though how did that shape you to like who you are 
as a character even here in this film? Like, how did that shape you right now? The, the bifurcation of society and the absolute knowledge of white, of white privilege. Yeah. One of the first things I ever did when we were new to Jackson, Mississippi is we went downtown to a government building and I was probably six years old. And I went to go get a drink out of the water fountain. And my mother said, no, no, it was the child size water fountain. Mm -hmm. This is all very honest. A lot of yeah, people are going to yeah. be very upset hearing all this shit. Yeah, yeah. But, but you've got to be real. Wasn't so, for you. <laughs> and it's a podcast and yeah. it's my experience. Yeah, for sure. And I want you to be real, man. This is how people connect to the films. They actually get to hear the people behind the films. It's just not some generic, you know, tell me your motivation for this part. Of, who gives a crap? But like, it's the yeah. entire world is our motivation, right? So you got to know these people. It is. And, <laughs> and history is still unfolding. Yes. And my little piece of history, and I can discuss this openly when I'm in Houston, mm -hmm. when I'm in Atlanta, mm -hmm. when I'm, I'm in minority majority cities, because we tell the truth to each other. Right. We all know. Everybody knows. Everything is known. The South has its history and it's bloody and it's brutal and it's also very mystical and it's also got a strange beauty to it now mm -hmm. that history has unfolded. Yeah. And you know, I mean, it's like the, it's like the mayor of Atlanta said uh, when everything first began breaking out about George Floyd, she said, we live in Wakanda. Yeah. We are an economically successful black, white, Asian, we're a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. We're achieving. We're making this shit happen. That's real. Yeah. Because when I was drinking out of the little kid's size fountain, my mother came to me, picked me up and said, no, you're not supposed to drink out of there because it was coloreds only. Yeah, yeah. That's what it said. I'm, the, shorter, I'm not, the shorter, for the people that don't know, the shorter drinking fountains were for- To uh, make them bow yeah. down. Yeah, exactly. And she took me over to the- higher fountain which was too tall so i had <laughs> like, to be picked up so none of us are living so <laughs> like, I'm just thirsty. like i'm just thirsty like how can a sister get a drink that's all i want to know right well so um, the only thing the only thing before we move on to carson the only other thing that i want to ask you is when you okay so you you've been through it you've seen the fire you've seen the brimstone it shaped you and stuff like that but is there anything in particular during this time period a moment of reflection, a moment of self growth that you were able to have that now you can like relay and build upon in this new chapter, because that's what I think everybody's <sighs> about right now. It's like, okay, we, we, we're there. Now what's next, you know? So what to see history change, you have to watch people change. Facts. And in one of those very late night conversations my mother was having with my dad, he wanted to get the hell out of there and so did she. Um, his entire company he worked for were all Klansmen. So he knew everything that was happening and they knew that he knew. And as he said to my mother, he said, Sue, I'm, not, and I'm just going to be frank. Okay. I'm being frank. Sue, I might be a bigot, but I'm not a murderer. That was the distinction to be yeah, made for sure. in the sixties in Jackson, Mississippi. You had to choose. Yeah. And I remember so distinctly when we were moving, because at that point I was 12 years old, I read the newspapers. I knew about the civil rights workers who had been murdered by the sheriff's department in Neshoba County, Mississippi. They were all Klansmen. They were buried in a levee. They were registering black voters. Yeah. This happened. This is our history. This is real. This is. And I remembered my father saying to us in the car, I have been wrong about many things. Yeah. We moved to Houston, Texas, where the wealthiest family on the block were Mexican. They were Mexicans. He was a business owner. I watched my family change and grow and be different. You know, my mother was Jewish. I didn't even know that until we got to Houston, Texas, because, uh, but they yeah, had taken us talking about that down there in Mississippi, brother. You can't, I know I guess. she had taken us. She had taken us to synagogue one time. Yeah. And um, my mother, my if my mother could have crossed the bridge at Selma, she would have. Yeah. Because she grew up very poor and white, which yeah. means she lived in, in the black community. 
right. in a mixed community. So her sensibilities were entirely different. But I watched my father being wrong and I watched my mother being right. Yeah. And that's, that's an important powerful. thing. Yeah, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. Okay. Very uh, I powerful. Want, I want to come back to you because, lady, we could talk about this stuff all day. Like, let me. Of let course, me we start. couldn't. We got to talk right, about it. Right. Let me, let me go start the, newer, <laughs> the, the Negro Spiritual Podcast. First episode, Caroline Williams. We'll get at it. Okay. I got I you, Mama. Right, let me watch, hear right. from my boy. Let me hear from Carson, though, man. Like, how are how, how you doing, sir? Like, what's what, like, creative man that you are? Like, what's, what's, because I know. Like you guys, like you get in front of these laptops and you and these ideas start to flourish and there's so many projects that I'm sure that are just sitting on the tip of your tongue or just in the back of your mind that you're casually going through. But it's hard not to let real life, real world just kind of interfere every once in a while. You know, like I like to say they just kind of throw up little detours and roadblocks sometimes whenever we're trying to get some stuff accomplished. So how's things been for you? Um, overall and well-being, health, spirituality, anything, man. What's going on with you? Yeah, for sure. Um, fortunately, we're all in good health, like Eric yeah. said. A yeah. couple of grandparents, a good amount. And, you know, luckily we're in Connecticut. Things are okay. Trending in the right direction. Uh, it's interesting because this has sort of been a time to uh, reflect and have conversations that we're sort of forced into having, sort of being quarantined. Yeah. And we're fortunate enough to have this project that – sort of preaches empathy in a really mm -hmm. interesting way. Mm -hmm. So we really want to be able to kind of like get the right eyeballs on it so people can kind of feel that and we can add this to the conversation. And right. you're talking about real life and these sort of fictional things we come up with, but I think there's sort of a symbiotic relationship between the two with, with the stuff we're working on and the stuff right. going on around us. And we want to be able to channel that in a way that sort of affects people in a positive way that encourages I think positive discussions that can can really get the ball rolling on some stuff. I mean, Carson, what's more real life than like your local radio station? You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's not the essence of right. just like Americana. You know what I mean? Because I remember watching movies not even involving the horror genre growing up, like um, Hollywood Nights and and films like that, where like the biggest or like think of something like um, the Warriors, where there's just this huge impact of like the local radio DJ and then and like how they you know take it back to like the Miss Saigon stuff that was going on in Vietnam where just like that presence in the studio is really really the kind of reflection of what's going on and like the mind frame and then you know as Caroline is taking phone calls from people in the movie and getting real real about some stuff that's going on with her like don't you feel like that's exactly kind of like what we're all involved in right now is just getting that reflection back to us like damn this is the country we live in this is the world that we're a part of right now yeah totally and it's interesting too to sort of like i think view the radio voice as like an omnipresent mm -hmm. voice for for people every everywhere you might not necessarily know what they look like but like you know what it means to tune into something to have right. like a communal experience of something right. and that's sort of what we're all having right now so i think there's a sort of um connection there that, that I think is really interesting. And I, well, I'm, I'm glad to see both of you guys doing good. Yeah, what'd you say, Eric? I was gonna say, I'm the care. it's interesting because I mean, just generally, I mean, I'm not, I don't wanna, um, I, I don't wanna make false connections or anything, but just the idea of a, somebody like Amy Marlowe, who is um, a personal voice that brings people together for personal conversations on a broader stage, I mean, the movie is about what happens if you lose that. Are you innovating? Are you moving forward by sort of losing that and automating moving forward? Like, is, is that progress or are we losing something if we lose the capacity to have personal conversations in a public? I agree. I mean, I think. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm glad you said that. And we're going to jump in over to Adam real quick before we kind of finish this all off. But I like to kind of jump a little bit more on what you're talking about. It's the thing that I connected with with Amy in the movie is the fact that I am a Midwestern boy where just like she was talking about with her parents, being able to see this growth that they've now truly have seen some of the error of their own ways and stuff like that. I live in a city, St. Louis, you guys know what's in my city. Ferguson happened here, St. all that stuff, you know, it's a lot of stuff that has happened in my city. Um, but yet there is still this mentality that everything is okay you know, and then they're all comfortable. And and now to see them get a little bit uncomfortable, it really, when I was watching the film and seeing Amy go through this, 
what was happening to her in the movie, and we'll get a little bit more into it here in a second, it made me think about all those people sitting comfortable in their houses and, and just thinking that everything's okay. And, oh, we got another day to go to Trader Joe's or another day to go to Target, and we're going to be <laughs> fine, you know what I mean? And Whole Foods is not going to cancel. And then all of a sudden, they show up to that Whole Foods, and there's 200 college kids with Black Lives Matter and mask on and I can't breathe and stuff like that. And now their world has been interrupted. And, and it's, what are we going to do now? And that's the first thing that they all say is, what are we going to do? You know, it's like, you're going to get back in your Range Rover and you're going to go back to your house. <laughs> or you're going to go to the other Whole Foods, you know? So I think that's one of the things that I was able to instantly grab out of this film once we started to kind of see the direction you guys were taking with the story that, okay, Amy's Karen. Like, you know, if you guys understand the reference of Karen and, and what that means right now, it's like, you, you, you know, Carol, you got a little bit of Karen in you in this because you're kind of oblivious to the fact that, darling, things have to change sometimes, you know? Um, all right, so let's get to Adam before we jump more into this movie. Brother, how are you doing down there, man? How's, how's family? How's life? How's the mind? How's the conscious? How's the soul? Yeah, man, I think uh, overall, feeling real lucky, you know? I got family in good health. I got a uh, family close. So I'm feeling really lucky, but I'm, I'm definitely worried. Yeah. yeah. I got a lot of worries. Um, yeah. My mom's a teacher. Uh, my, I got high risk family members. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, not just with coronavirus, I'm worried about the state of our country overall. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, uh, yeah, talking about some of these themes with, within the movie, even about just like change. Yeah. And that it's hard to embrace change sometimes, but what yeah. are you going to do? You're going to fight it and die? Or are you going to embrace it and live, you know? Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. Well, we're living, man. And we got this 10 minutes to midnight to talk about. And like I said, I brought up Near Dark for a reason because I'm an old school 80s vampire like movie fan. Like, I want my vampires violent. <laughs> I want my vampires mean. But one of the things that I really, really enjoyed about this, and Eric, I'm, you and Carson, I'm really like jumping into you guys about this, is in the review, I mentioned the movie The Roost only because it's been a while since I've seen anyone take the concept. And I'm not going to give anything away on like the overall concept until people see the film. But what you guys use, your vampire story, we don't get to see that too much. But when you're a kid who grew up watching Lost Boys and all these other amazing oh, vampire yeah. movies from our childhood, you know the lineage of there's wolves involved, there's bats involved, there's all these other things. It's not just some Rico suave ass dude with a three piece suit on <laughs> that can kind of speak busted Italian, like snatching up everybody, you know? In a cape. Exactly. So Carson, Eric, can you guys kind of tell me how like 10 Minutes to Midnight came to be, the, the, like where it came from and, and how we were able to get this, this project rolling with the rest of these amazing people involved? Or do you want me to? You can start and I'll jump in. I think we, um, we sort of started with um, this sort of vampire concept and the idea of being able to use that as a metaphor for, for more than just a, a vampire, if mm -hmm. you will, and kind of extending that into like the effect it has on human lives. Uh, I had this idea of potentially doing this overnight concept where it was like a pressure cooker and there might be a supernatural element involving a vampire. And Eric really had this taking to a radio aesthetic um, that he sort of had innate in him for a long time. And it became a fusion of those two concepts. Eric, do you? Yeah, yeah, I, I, to, to your point about vampiricism, I, I, the idea of vampiricism as a metaphor for, for death or like, the the world being vampiric to start like I mean it, it was important to us that we never said the word vampire in the movie yeah before. for sure obviously like it's it's you're kind of getting hit over the head with some iconography or some like puns or the garlic noodles or whatever yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, for that, like for that like old school uh late night anthology vibe Twilight Zone Stephen King kind of whatever just to say so you sort of the audience is so aware that the world is askew, but the characters are like, everything's, right. um, you know, for fun and also just show the obliviousness of people too. And then use vampirism as a metaphor for, for forced death and change and whatever. And um, using all those things just to make something that functioned as a fun flick, but also commentary. And we brought this up in an, another interview today. It was important to us that there was, that there was no like, 
villain in this movie. It was, yeah. it was, uh, habits were the villain. A system was the villain. Aaron, Aaron was kind of asshole a couple times in the film. <laughs> he was kind of an asshole. <laughs> All right, I don't mean to call no, you out, bro, but you're kind of asshole. I <laughs> mean, I, I totally agree, but I think that <laughs> that's human, you know, to me. And I think that there's definitely times in this where, you know, you look at this guy and you go, well, that's not the most honorable move. Yeah. You say, well, <laughs> man, if I, was, if I was right, you know, if, if this was my safety, if this is where I could be myself, where I could thrive, and all of a sudden I was threatened between loyalty and self-preservation. Right. I don't know. I think there are shades of gray there yeah. that are, you know, that, right. that can be empathized with. Maybe not by you, Tram. Yeah, know. yeah, for sure. I think in some ways, yeah. functions is, and again, not to get too into spoiler territory, so come right, here right. as seconds but like in some ways the the whole emotional aspect with amy and aaron aaron is like the ultimate betrayal to her because mm -hmm. it's there there is this like mm -hmm. you know he didn't tell her that he knew something was brewing and i think that that's a real slight because it's you know it, is the value in that relationship perceived is it a fabrication is it only a matter of convenience is it only in certain circumstances does it exist outside of the radio station yeah. is is the community that has been built here fabricated or is it real is it only real during between these hours um and how does that extend to other communities and authenticity and the parts we play and stuff like well, that? well i love that you brought up earlier eric to track back to what you were saying about using it as a metaphor isn't that almost like marriage in a sense like what that ultimate betrayal like the husband didn't tell the wife that he got the job promotion or the wife didn't tell the husband that she had an affair and then it's just like that what happens when that bond that has been created for such a long time just gets ripped and broken? And, and, and I think you guys did a great job of being able to uh, add that conversation to the movie, but yet not still lose those late night people that you were talking about before that are still kind of yearning to be like, okay, well, I know this is a horror movie, so let me see some blood. You know what I mean? Yeah, so. yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's meant to be a fun late night flick. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, if they, if, if, you're not like in the mood for commentary. You can still have a fun time, but like yeah, it's there. Big time. But Caroline, I mean, but it's still, but that commentary is a motivator for the character action that leads to the bloody stuff anyway. Yes, you know what I mean? Yes, all big time. Mm -hmm. I spoke to this earlier is the whole idea of this, this is the family that she chose. Maybe uh -huh. she has kids, maybe she doesn't, but this is the world that she has built. And, right. and, mm -hmm. and now she's obsolete within that world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and Caroline, why music just... has changed. Everything has changed. Right. You know, it's it goes back to what you were saying about the forces of change. Mm -hmm. And Aaron's young. Aaron can still embrace that and continue on with his career and his life. Sure. And being an asshole and, and everything else that, you know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, man. For sure. But I think like, okay, so the main thing that attracted me to the initial like first 20 minutes of the film was you because like I don't think thank you like Carson Eric you guys like you're casting people everybody involved you got the girl like when you think of like the rocker late night DJ no holds bar bad bitch probably worked at a bar smoked way too many cigarettes had way too many relationships with way too many scumbags this is and, what we talked was, about that was it <laughs> Like, I mean, that was Amy. Amy. Like, totally. the, the minute you see her, you know her. Like, I, I live, That's so right. where I live in St. Louis is the south side of St. Louis. And that area has a lot of biker bars, a lot of punk rock hangouts and stuff like that. It's been like that forever, which is why I love south side St. Louis. And I run into women like Amy every damn day. I used to like yeah. bartend with girls like Amy every day. So tell me when you were given or when you were approached or when you went after the role, for Amy, like what was your initial like image of her? And do you think you were able to really, really justify who that character should be in 10 Minutes to Midnight? Absolutely, because um, I've told this story a little bit before. Um, you know, I was married for a very long time, wife, mother, my kids are grown. A few years back, I thought to myself, I would love to get back in the game, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and the weird thing is, is that style of music was my style of music back in the day. Right. <laughs> and, and so there are all these bands, Wednesday 13, who g gives us our musical identity in the film, Pantera, mm -hmm. Misfits, mm -hmm. uh, 
all those bands were definitely a part of my early, that's, that's my musical soundtrack, right. you know, for a lot of my life. And so here's, I, I, I thought to myself, that's who she is. She never left. Amy never got married. She never had kids. She never even really had any heavy duty romances. She likes it when the bands come into town. Everything that you just said right. is precisely the foundation of her character. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is, like you said, hip hop, rap, music has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, Aaron's going to change along with it. Mm -hmm. uh, Sienna is a part of that she is change. Is the change right? Bringing that yeah, change, she sure. is the change. Right. So it's it's definitely. Um, I mean, she sees her life. Her life style is dying yeah. to an extent, and that's what the movie, in many ways, is about. Yeah, it's. I mean, but it's one of those things where, like, you do see it. Like, it, it, Eric Carson, you guys are not shying away from like, it is time. Like, lady, we love you and thank you for your time. You know what I mean? Like, it is really exactly. It is really back really in the day. To see that um, you're like so, Carson. Tell me about when you're when you're creating characters and when you're looking and Eric, you can chime in on whatever you want to on this as well. But when you guys are creating these characters and you know that they're going to have to go through this such significant like um, transition, because like what I like films, I'm a kid who grew up watching plays. So I'm always a fan if I do see like acts, you know what I mean? If I can literally see that, hey, they've satisfied what they need to do on this part of the film. And now here's the next part that's gonna keep us engaged. Like what, when you guys are trying to piece this all together and you're looking at characters like Amy, like Sienna, like um, Aaron, are you guys just taking these from people you know? Or are these, are these just constructs that you've always been around and you just assume are part of the industry? Like I'm curious to where these characters came from. I think I'll, I'll speak directly to Amy and Sienna first. Okay. Um, I think they're both a synthesis of um, a lot from their generation, I think um, put up into like a single sort of like embodiment and, and mm -hmm. sort of like you can see the conflict as they go head to head. Eric, do you wanna like? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's, it stemmed from that relationship, the generational gap, what it is to be a woman in the industry and the different tactics people use to survive and, um, uh, and, to, and to get ahead and how that works and it doesn't, again, there are no, villains in this movie because I think there's a lot of empathy to be had for Amy but like especially if you're a young person you also sort of get the go-getterness of Sienna but right. inherent conflict when the thing that Amy's devoted her life to becomes a stepping stone for Sienna and Amy's kicked out and so when we're talking about change I think that the movie and other work that I've done uh, uh, at a tv show that Adam Adam worked on too that's about change and innovation and progress it, it, it's sort of about the idea of like the inevitability of it, but mm -hmm. the, the the pitfalls that you can get into by trying to hang on too tight to something, but also the pitfalls mm -hmm. and hurdles that can happen when you rush in too blindly. So it's like you're getting you're getting Amy who's so stuck, and you're getting Sienna who's so laser focused on right, um, right. and and to the point where like things are getting destroyed in her wake. So what happens when those two forces, which are both kind of right and kind of wrong, yeah. come together, um, mm -hmm. and and you know and how, and using vampirism as a, as a, as sure. a I feel like it's almost like Facebook versus TikTok. I mean, isn't that what we got going on in this world? Right now? <laughs> <laughs> totally. My space. <laughs> Amy is my space. Or even like, <laughs> <laughs> I think Amy's like blogger, honestly, like we got to, we got to take it back a little bit. <laughs> we got to take it back. So, um, you know, and I, for all, any, any one of you guys can chime in on this. Definitely Aaron to hear a little <laughs> bit more at, about Aaron's character from Adam. Like, tell me how, when you guys, we all grew up watching vampire movies. We all watched these late night films that have become a part of us to the point where now we're able to do something creative with them and, and give joy to other people. Like, what are some things that like just allows you to be happy enough to say like, man, my job's actually pretty cool right now. Like I'm sitting on this set and we got, you know, this amazing story about this young lady going through this tr transition. And then, you know, and, and by the way, there's people with, neck exploding everywhere <laughs> <laughs> it make it even better like how, like tell me adam like how does it like tell me about the set how was everything um there and and how did it feel working with this team because it seems like you guys are like a strong unit 
um, yeah um, be able to put this I, out. so how was it i mean it was it was a definitely you know the independent uh, production comes with its own challenges for sure uh, uh, eric and i and carson have been working together for uh you know six or seven years ago that we met um and we've been you know we've kind of been adapting this model of using what we have available to make the movies we can make when we can make them uh we're not we are independent producers it's right. not a necessarily a glamorous uh set that we're on but we're on a set full of passionate people with a goal everyone is invested in this everyone is getting you know they people are doing more than what's asked of them you know and uh yeah i mean it's it's such an exciting challenge yeah really you gotta really think on your feet it there are days where you know we we're in an active radio station so we show up at uh you know they they end their day at five or six p.m we i'd show up at uh four o'clock and start getting first meal ready and right. then come there could eat then we'd get the set going as soon as it was ready okay i'm gonna get into costume and get my okay we're gonna do this shot and then we got to go look at the script to see if right. we can you know how we can get this scene in less shots because at 5 a.m the new you know the morning show is coming in and we got to make our day got to be done yeah well, adam is also i mean adam is the unsung hero in the sense that like you know we'll be doing that and he'll be doing a scene and then he'll run and do something else and then like you know we have we've, we've done the rest of the scene and it's like all right we need your coverage get it done in one take and it's like, yep we got it because i mean it's, it's, but that's sort of the beauty of it is that we all just sort of know what sacrifices we have to make and where and how we need to be and move around and in terms of just like me crunching numbers and running back to set and then directing them what I mean it's everybody's doing multiple things and I think on set we function in a way where it's less when I say it's not hierarchy what I mean is that there's no like it's not it's not um prohibitively rigid it's it's I think we're more of like it's unilateral like everything in terms of directing is like filtering through me but people are there's there's independence but also overlap and it's it's a it's it's more of a commune with, yeah. with as opposed to like you know didactic it's like, it's like everybody knows their role everybody knows they have to play a little bit more of a part if we're going to get it done and that's right. like to me that is the essence of and that's why i've always been so happy to speak with people that are doing it from the independent standpoint because i think you don't really understand that until you have to come together as a team to really make sure we're progressing. Yeah. Like, you're going to have people that need to be the leaders when it's time to be the leaders, the people that need to step back when it's time to step back. But I think if there's an overall collective thought of progression and we need to get this done and we know we like life restraints are always going to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. I think as long as you have the right people around you and anything is possible. And I mean, you guys showed it. I mean, you guys have a great film. So you, you guys have showed it, that it's possible to happen. Thank you. Um, it's, you know, I'm, the thing that kills me, so I, I asked everybody this, because I've been, of course, these interviews have been going crazy because there's like three film festivals going on right now yeah. and everybody's at home, so everybody's available to talk to. Um, the thing that I've always been curious about during this is when you guys, this pandemic, like I've always asked people, like I was talking to a couple young ladies um, one of the actresses, she was in this film, Widow's Point. Um, she did a great job in the movie. But one of the things I asked her, it was kind of like, where were you when the pandemic happened? You know, because I like the way that I put it is I just got back from the gym. I just finished training some of my high school athletes. Um, I had um, the Women's Film Festival, um, E3, they were just starting to send out some of the first like shorts that were gonna be involved in the project. So I knew I had some stuff to watch, but I just remember coming out of the shower and looking on the TV and seeing the people in the NBA game, like walking away mm -hmm. and, and then all of a sudden shut down and then you turned on the news and I'm like, this is canceled, this is canceled. And yeah, even though for the right. weeks leading up to it, we knew something was potentially <clears throat> gonna happen. I'm curious to where you guys were, if you had any projects going on. And then Eric, especially even more like, what about this film? Like we're in the process of selling this film, getting this film out here, putting it in festivals, submitting it and stuff like that. What kind of, I'm sure some fears, ladies and gentlemen, popped up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, where I was, I mean, it was Carson and I, I don't know what we were doing. We, we were like, ah, oh, it's going to be a couple of weeks. You probably go to the movies just in case those shut down for a couple of weeks. And it was like, <laughs> a couple of weeks. We were, 
come in, better get it. And then, we, and then we get back and the news is on and they're like, tomorrow all of this stuff starts. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. Yeah. Yeah. If the, the country shut down. Right. <laughs> okay. No, I remember we, we, there was a concert that night. I think we were doing something 10 minutes to midnight related. And we were like, should we, should we, sorry, I can't turn that off. Uh, should we go to the concert tonight? And we're like, maybe we shouldn't. And then, then very shortly after it was just, everything was done. So it was really funny, but yeah. it was like, right when it set in, I think there was this like stages of grief period. We, had, <clears throat> because we knew what that meant for kind of rolling this out. Unfortunately, we're able to have the the situation that we do have with it right now because yeah. everything so ambiguous back then. I mean, in terms of in terms of plans, you know, we when we were shooting this last summer, we had a very clear idea. All of us. I mean, we talked about it frequently. You know, and Carson, like it's going to be a big fall horror festival birth. We're going to be living on airplanes. We're right. going to be you know, like a van, whatever it's going to be. Right. And it, we were ready for it, and we were planning for it. And then when this when this was happening in March, we were like, "All right, maybe things will turn around. Maybe things will turn around by October." And like, obviously, you know, we yeah. it, but like, yeah. um, and so we're like, "All right, well, we have to pivot because the movies we're not we're not waiting. The movie's still getting born. There's buzz around it. Yeah. Lucky to have some great festivals like Grimfest, and to have an amazing. We we had a world premiere at Popcorn Frights, and which is a great fest in Florida, and they did a pop up drive for us, featured us, sold it out. And we're using, I wanted to go. And, I, and we're using that as a, a, cata, a catalyst for other event screenings and after screenings and some theatrical screenings that are happening around the country. And Caroline's actually going to be coming into the Northeast and going to some of these events and quarantining for a little bit. And then she's going to come and we're going to... Rock and we're, roll. Get it up in your nose, lady. We're doing a hybrid festival, virtual, outdoor screening, special event party. Yeah, I mean, we're doing a big hybrid thing because... Um, we want to birth this movie and it needs yeah. it. So we're like, like, like when we made the movie, we're doing it on our own terms and sure. as we can, this is our mantra. And, you know, Adam can speak to this too, like doing what we can with what we have at our disposal. And that's all we right. can do. I mean, we're going to distribute it and birth it the same way we made it, you know? So yeah. I was talking, so earlier when I was talking to all you guys about like some of the things and Caroline and I were talking about like growth and all the stuff that happened with her parents during this time period. I think what another thing that I've been able to really just embrace during this time period is this COVID has allowed us to return to the wild, wild west, right? Like we can remind ourselves that we can take control of these things and put them out the way that we want to. And I think it's important for the younger generation, the people who are watching your films right now, like we were watching other people, to be able to see a time period like this, to know that like, look, man, it was global pandemic going on, people dying in the streets, right? Like, road protests, rioting going on everywhere. But yet, you had a collective group of people who put a film together one summer, and and they knew that they needed this film to breathe to allow people to remind themselves that hey, the world is terrible and the world is scary, but it's good to have a laugh. It's good to just to see some good old fashioned gore every once in a while and enjoy it because people do take this world too serious. And, you know, I get into arguments because I'm a whore, I'm a true, I will say I am a true horror movie fan. The I don't care the genre. Now I don't get into like the snuff films and stuff like that. And believe me, people have tried to send them to me and I've sent them back like, mm -hmm. I'm like, sorry, bro, I'm not reviewing this. <laughs> like, I just, I got, like, like I said, I'm gonna go back to the whole black man thing. Like if somebody was to bust in my apartment, I don't want these films laying around uh, <laughs> in my house, okay? It's like having clean um, underwear on when you go to the Right, like, room. exactly. Um, <laughs> but I think, um, I think it speaks volumes that you guys are taking the fight to it yourself with this movie, because if we didn't have collectives like you guys out there I, th I don't think we would have films like 10 minutes to midnight anymore what do you guys think i have to say what unites us as human beings is our love of music mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. movies mm -hmm. these are the things that help bring us together risks abound in life yeah. there's all kinds of shit flying around in the air right now that could turn into some new thing Right. And nobody knows. Right. Um, there are crazy people out there that will shoot you because you're driving while black. Mm 
Right. There are risks they'll shoot you everywhere. Mask on now, like let's be honest, they'll shoot you because you're wearing a damn mask. Like it's crazy. And you're wearing a damn mask, but you know what? I'm willing to wear the damn mask if wear I can get mask. on a plane right. and fly to Connecticut and go to Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and go to places where I can greet the fans. Yep. This is our gift. This is what we made yep. so that all of us can be together and enjoy this story. It's the stories that unite us. Yes, exactly. And what I love about horror is horror is so inclusive now. It has changed in some pretty spectacular ways yeah. that are very, very hopeful for the product because yeah. it may, hearing all of these stories from everywhere, um, that is what unites us, whether you're LGBTQ, whether you're black, whether you're Asian, whether you live in Europe, whether you live in, uh, uh, you know, Antarctica, whatever. If you've got a voice and you've got a story, tell it. Yeah. Don't you guys feel that we live in this world right now? I've been asking Eric, you guys, you and Carson can really answer this question too. And even, you know, um, Adam with you, all you guys, cause you're producers, you guys are, you know, you guys are involved in these projects. I've been asking all the directors and writers, like, are we at a time right now where it's okay for us to put this social commentary in our films, in our projects, and be able to kind of create our own conversations with this stuff too? Or should we do what these conservative people keep telling us to do? Shut up and dribble or just act or, you know, or just, just focus on your craft and just entertain us. But I feel like we have a brain so yeah. if, we, if we feel like we want to be able to put this stuff into our books, into our movies, into our pre projects of passion, that it's okay. I don't know, what do you guys think? I think it's okay. I mean, I, I don't think you're gonna, I don't think you're gonna, it, you could try as hard as you want. I don't think you're gonna force people to not put themselves into what they do. Right. You know, I, and it, it doesn't make sense to try it. They, they might be good enough at it that you don't perceive it. Yeah. You might not be offended by it, yeah. but that's not, that's not their job. Arguably, if you don't want to think, then don't, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff you don't have to think at, yeah. uh, but everyone, you know, no one can tell you what you should do. Mm -hmm. you know? Precisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Director's choice. If you want to do something that's just entirely fantasy, that has nothing to do with, with any current events or, or any kind of distinctive perspective, yeah. you can always do that, but right. there's always going to be a segment of the audience that is curious about the commentary, right. that is curious yeah. to know what somebody else thinks. Right. And as long as you have that kind of curiosity, there's gonna be a filmmaker out there that speaks to you. And I feel like the best stuff is at that intersection. I mean, we always say this, the best of us at the, I mean, like where, where the conflict is, yeah, exactly, where the, where, where the conflict is fueled by uh, the, the fantasy of it and the fantasy is fueled by the conflict of it and, some, and it's making some comments. I mean, I think, when you're doing it right, it's all happening at the same time, which is, you know, when I things agree. aren't happening, it's because it feels like, you know, you're, you're being didactic or being patronizing to an audience or trying to be whatever. But I think when the, when, when it's happening right, you're able to have a, and that's hopefully what 10 Minutes to Midnight is, it's a fun yeah. flick that's, yeah. that's saying for those who are willing and able to hear it. But it's I, a commentary on death. We also want to be a sleepover where like you're there with your friends and you're like, oh, I'll throw this on because it's right. a fun time. Vampires, <laughs> like okay. it's fun. Sure. And I think, I think it's interesting too, because it sort of yeah. becomes either or conversation, but yeah. I do think telling a story that's great and also having that depth can be synonymous. Yeah. And I think it's always about trying to find that and execute it the way that will resonate with people because it's personal and we can yeah. all empathize with someone regardless of anything, if, you, if the story is right and you, and you can sort of live that life with them for a little bit. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Totally agree. So this has been fantastic. Like I could literally talk to all you guys for hours, but I know we got life and we got things we need to do. Um, <laughs> so I do want to, I do want to kind of put this on a closing note for the rest of us um, as we wind this interview down. And once again, thank every single one of you guys for your time, Adam Carson, Eric, Caroline, you guys are great. Um, like I said, this, these are the, as a 41, I know I might not look it. Uh, I was a 41. <laughs> <laughs> it, I'm happy when I still see films like what Eric was just saying and what Carson was saying, like these fun films that we can just be like, man, 
Like we, it doesn't always have to be some just like a long overdrawn thought process. Those films are good too. And they have their purpose and they have their, their place, but it's also nice every once in a while just to say, yo, this is what it's like to go to a drive in and see a movie like this or go to a late night theater and see a movie like this. And then the fact that you guys brought all those elements of the radio station, the, the, the betrayal. And then of course it all just being woven, this tale being woven around this, <laughs> weird little yeah <laughs> vampiric uh, episode right? we all we all that's a great unifier too we all show up to see this outdoor movie and it's like yeah. oh shit we all had fun with this oh cool yeah exactly yeah because that's what it's all about it's just bringing people together and i think that's the thing about 10 minutes to midnight even though i've already written the review now that i've got a chance to meet the people behind the scenes that's what really now stands out about this movie. Not just Caroline, not just Sienna, not just all you guys and what you did in the movie. I just think now that I know that it was just just strong collective that put yeah. it together of some people that were like, we're not gonna let this movie go away. It makes sense even more when you watch the film again because you do see that cohesion. You do see that unity from scene to scene to scene. I mean, the parts with, with Amy and Aaron are flawless. Like, I mean, you could, you actually feel like they've been working together in a record sta station for 30 years. Like that's, you see that it's probably been that transition where Amy looked at Aaron as like her son or her little brother. And then, then they became equals once he became a better producer and got more into his craft. And of course, just like any good old fashioned all American boy, when I'm better than you, I'm taking over. <laughs> my turn my turn <laughs> and that's i mean that i think that goes right back to what you know eric was saying at the beginning like it is this system it yeah. is this tradition and this yeah. habit that you know sure. that's what puts bob that's what really makes robert uh, you know an enemy in the movie is yeah. what what he was told to expect you know for sure mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah he's still person, in charge and, you know he stays in charge yeah the yeah. whole time i mean the thing about bob Bob can see the trend line. Bob can see what's in front of him. I think Amy was kind of a, sort of insular, isolated herself exclusively to everything that she loved about WLSC and her role in it. For sure, for sure. Eric, before we get out of here, man, from you, what, what is something that you hope people get outside? I mean, we've talked <laughs> about the fun, we've talked about the, the kind of underlying commentary that for some people may be there, some people may not be there. But really, at the end of the day, what are you guys hoping people get from 10 Minutes to Midnight when they finish watching this movie? I, I hope it feels like you're uh, a kid again, staying up slightly too late and flipping on some anthology show you've never heard of and seeing an episode that you're a little too young to watch yeah. and uh, yeah. having a really good time with it. And it's like you're, you're, I want you to feel like you're the only one who's still awake in your house and then you're watching something on TV. And that's awesome. That's, that's, that's the feeling that I think has united us from the beginning. You got it, man. You guys did it. That's exactly how I felt when I watched that movie. I felt like I was downstairs at my grandma's house trying to, you remember the cable boxes where you had to hit the plus button? Oh my God. You know, so, <laughs> you know, we had that channel. You know what I mean? You're dating yourself, line. dude. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Um, but hey, your boy, hey, I was up at, you know, whatever at night watching Cinemax late at night trying to watch all the Emmanuel movies and then the zombie reanimator movie would come on after that and stuff like that. So no, I, I think you guys nailed that right on the head. And it's been such a pleasure to talk to you guys. Um, you guys have all been fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, I'm really, I, Grimfest has a gem with this one. Um, and the people who were able to get a chance to see it, I know they're talking their butts off about it. The reviews have been great so far that I've been reading about it. And I'm sure once that true mainstream, because you know there's always that subsect of people who are just still like, oh, I didn't even know there were horror movie festivals out there still. <laughs> <laughs> like, how the hell do you think these things get here? Um, I think once they get a chance, and I even put this in the review, once they get a chance, once the masses get a chance to see this movie, I think it'll even create more of a cult following and take off from there because it is gonna be the movie that the, the housewives will be able to sit down and be drinking some rosé and eating some popcorn and watching, but even their kids might be upstairs doing the same thing, putting the phones down for a minute and watching something like this. So really, really appreciate you guys so much. From your thank lips you. to God's ear, Travis, thank you so, so much. Oh, you're very, very welcome, Caroline. It was such, such a pleasure 
talking to you and like in like I could talk to you anytime um